You know, physics is finally understanding the profound implications of God's command, let there be light. So science and spirituality are finally meeting together. Up next, Fred Allen Wolf joins us. His latest work, Time Loops and Space Twists. Fred's next on Coast to Coast AM. Dr. Fred Allen Wolf, Ph.D., physicist, writer, lecturer. His work in quantum physics and consciousness is well known through his very popular scientific writings. He is the author of a number of books, including Taking the Quantum Leap, Time Loops, and Space Twists as well the recipient of the prestigious National Book Award for Science as well. I'm looking forward to this. Fred, welcome back. How are you? Fine, George. Thanks. It's great to be back on your show. My again. pleasure. My pleasure. You've been busy over the years, my friend. I just keep plugging away. Uh, the years pile on, but I keep doing what I'm doing, and I'm enjoying every every single moment of it. So why do they call you, Fred, Dr. Quantum? <laughs> well, that came about because I appeared with none other than Timothy Leary back in around 19, oh, must have been in the early 80s, at the Wilshire Ebell Theater in L.A. And I was his opening act. He must have just gotten out of the Who's Gal, and they wanted me to do a thing on quantum physics. So I did a kind of a magic show, which I appeared in one place and vanished, then appeared in another place and stuff like that. And I, I so uh, as a result of my appearances with, uh, with Timothy Leary, I was written up in a national magazine, and they called me Captain Quantum. And then later on, when the movie What the Bleep Do We Know came out, uh, yep. the producers started using that image uh, and called – they were going to use Captain Quantum, but Captain was already used by somebody else. So they used the term Dr. Quantum. So I <laughs> decided to no longer be Captain Quantum, and I changed myself to Dr. Quantum, which is now my trademark. And uh, that's how it all came about. So thank Timothy Leary. What did you think of him, by the way, Fred? Did, you, was he, did he really have that great mind? He was a pretty bright guy. Uh, and he was a kind of a leprechaun. He was a person that would experiment with life, and for that he had a lot of, uh, you know, he had a big heart. He was brave. Uh, he was willing to take chances. Uh, I don't approve of everything he did. Naturally, right, I understand. Uh, there were a lot of people got hurt from uh, experimenting with uh, with uh, drugs without knowing the full power that they can have on the mind and body. But uh, a lot of uh, what he did was to open the minds of a lot of people. So there was both pluses and minuses. Was he ahead of his time, do you think? I think he was right at the right time. Yeah. <laughs> I think he came in at the right time. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on. You know, that we're talking now going back to the early 60s and 70s. Uh, I, don't, I think maybe – I'm not sure when he started doing stuff at Harvard uh, with Ram Das. Maybe that was in the 60s. I'm not sure. Maybe even the late 50s. So I think it was right around the right time because we were getting to a point now where trusting Big, big Brother or the government was no longer the thing you wanted to do anymore. And free love started to blossom, and uh, most of us who were uh, coming out of uh, those uh, uh, years of everything being ideal and watching idealized families on television shows and stuff like that, uh, we were beginning to grow up. And so I think he came at the right time. Fred, you are a rarity among scientists, and I, I'm going to say that because you have combined the spiritual aspects of this with the scientific aspects, and not a lot of scientists are that open-minded or will do it. I think a few are beginning to come into your camp now, but you did this a long time ago. What made you kind of cross the two together? Well, it started when I was a child, actually. Uh, as, as a little guy, uh, I developed a speech impediment at the age of about seven or eight. I began to stammer really badly. It, it's kind of ironic that right now the, the movie that which won the Academy Award is about King George and his stammer. I had a terrible stammer. 
And I went to a speech therapist, and uh, the speech therapist actually had me learn meditation. I didn't know it was meditation. I didn't even know what meditation meant in those days. But I was meditating, and I was practicing breathing and uh, watching my breath and imagining candles. I mean, I was going into this whole mystical thing. I was eight, nine years old, and I don't know what this stuff meant. And I got interested, for some reason, uh, into magic. And I started doing magic tricks in front of a mirror and so forth. And I was pretty bright for a kid. So I started wondering about, well, what is light? And by the way, that's the subject of this book, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> now, many years later, and I'm still wondering about what is light. I was thinking about light and trying to figure out what it was. And I got the idea in my mind, even at that young age, that somehow light is some kind of a manifestation from some power. What do you want to call it? God, whatever you want to call it. And I wanted to understand how it worked. In other words, I thought of God as a magician, and I wanted to know how you do these tricks. <laughs> and that's what got me into physics. So there's how I get into it. So somebody sent me an email. And the magic is still part of me. I got an email right before you came on, Fred, from someone who wanted me to ask you, is God a great scientist or a great magician? I prefer the magician more than the scientist, but the scientist has got to be part of it. Uh, somehow, I, I see both necessary. I, 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 I remember when the movie The Matrix first came out, and uh, although I, did, I didn't much care for all the violence in the movie, but you need violence to keep people awake. In Hollywood, you got to do it to sell. You know? yeah, people fall asleep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> We're so overworked in America that you got to have those kind of spurts of, you know, to you keep got, people got, awake. you got to do it once in a while. What? You have to do it once in a while. They have to do it. But the movie was a very good one. It had a very good good idea. And uh, uh, it, it, so we as physicists are kind of toying with the matrix right now. We're playing with it. And that's what all these new experiments that are going on right now at uh, places like the Large Hadron Collider – and places like Fermi Lab uh, here in Batavia, Illinois, uh, we're experimenting. We're, we're trying to unravel the matrix, so to speak. We want to know how this universe comes into being, and we're now playing around with reactions, things at such a small scale that we're really looking at things as they might have been at the time that the universe first came into existence, the so-called Big Bang. And so we're playing with that. And so this is very exciting. This is a very exciting time for physics. And the uh, physicists themselves are, are you know, kind of agog a, a about this whole thing. And some of them are getting kind of like weirded out because of the spiritual implications of what we're doing. That's true. Do they don't like that? Well, they get freaked out. You see, so much of our education has been to the point of not asking these kinds of questions without going into a holier-than-thou attitude uh, either way. Holier-than-thou, thou shall not talk about religion or science or uh, religion and spirit, spirituality in the same, same tone, or there is no God, blah, 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 blah. you know, that kind of dogmatic attitude, which a lot of physicists tend to take into their way of thinking because they're so used to logical, rational kinds of reasoning, and they simply close their minds to it, or the other way. If you're going to talk about religion, you have to go into the whole thing. You've got to go to church. You've got to go to temple. You've got to go to this place or another place, and that's the only place where religion exists. You can't have it on an everyday, everyday basis. So it, it, this is, is really changing, and, and I think that, that when you try to separate these two parts of us, the spiritual, the heartfelt feeling for the way the things work from the mind, the intellectual, uh, logical, rational way of being, when you keep those so separated from each other, you tend to break down. You become relatively unhappy with your life. I'm a pretty happy guy, yeah. and I'm relatively happy because I don't see any break here. Um, I'm intellectually as capable as anybody – and I'm as spiritually aware as anybody, including anybody you want to mention. 
Any holier than thou you want to mention? I'm just spiritually aware of that guy, and I don't care who he is, whether he's the Dalai Lama or uh, whoever you want to call. I'm as aware as that guy is spiritually, and I'm as smart as any physicist is. I may not know exactly every calculation that every physicist does, but I have all the rationality to do what I need to do, and everybody has that. I'm no exception. I'm nothing special. Everybody has that, and so my job is to awaken people to the fact that you are special. You can do this stuff. You can bridge the gap, and when you start bridging that gap, an aliveness starts to occur in you, and the fear of either one of those ways of thinking dissipates, and you're no longer afraid to talk about this stuff or to think rationally or to think about spirituality and have them both together at once without any fear of being made a, made a fool. When we talk about quantum physics, and I try to ask so many physicists this, hoping that they will give us an explanation that we non-physicists can understand, how do you explain it, Fred? Well, quantum physics was invented. First, first I, have to, I, I, I have to caution everybody. Physics is the invention of human minds. Even though we lay out our invention as a kind of a map, it ain't the territory. It's a map of the territory. It's how we think the world is behaving. And so it goes way back when to the early Greeks and maybe even earlier than that to the ancient Egyptians. I'm not sure how far back we're going to find physical thinking or rational kind of logical thinking about the way the universe is constructed. But nevertheless, it is a map, not the territory. And so what physics does is it, it creates a vision of the world in which we see things a certain way. We tend, however, and this happens to all of us, to get confused by replacing the map, the territory, with the map. And we start to lay out the map, and before long, we're not seeing the territory anymore. That's one of the problems. All right, let's, let's talk about, you have said there are three important discoveries in the last 20 years about quantum physics. Let's, let's go through them first of all, Fred. And then, of course, as we get into your work time loops and space twists, we will really begin to wow some people about this relationship between science and what many people call God. But what are these three aspects that you say are superb discoveries? Okay, well, there are three basic ones. Okay, let's, let's talk about the first one. The first one simply states that the universe... That's the big, big thing out there is not made of solid hunks of matter, even though it looks like it is, but it is actually made from acts of consciousness. It's A-C-T-S, not A-X. Yeah. <laughs> from acts of consciousness that are brought to bear upon it. That's the first one. We'll go into that. Let me go to the second one. All right. Second one is... There is a field out there, a kind of a, what, what appears to be, as we look at it more closely, a field of mind. And this field of mind is as necessary for there to be matter, energy, whatever, light, as light energy itself are needed. It's very necessary to have this field of mind. Some physicists are calling it now the Higgs field, and I'll go into why we this definition came up. So that's the second part. There's okay. this mind field. The third one is that everything that we see, everything that's there, everything that we call physical reality, is ultimately made of particles of light. I call them luxon, L-U-X-O-N. Uh, because sometimes when I use the word light, people start to think I only mean the light that we see with our eyes. Right. Well, there's right. luxonic stuff all around us. Electrons are fundamentally luxonic, which means they move at the speed of light. Light that we see is luxonic. It moves at the speed of light. The uh, quarks make, make up the nucleus. They also fundamentally are luxonic, but they get in, embedded in a field of other kinds of light called gluons inside the nucleus. This is all gets very complicated very quickly, but nevertheless, the fundamental makeup is these things called lexon. Or would, lexon. would dark energy are also part of that too? Would dark energy be part of that? That's a good question, 
And there is some possibility uh, that dark energy could be something having to do with, you might say, information coming from the future. This is my friend Jack Sarfati, who has been uh, working on this idea for some time, and I think he thinks that's what this might be. I'm not sure I understand that, but it could be that's what it is. There may be another aspect to it. Uh, in the book, I talk about something which uh, has been, been bantied about for some time since the early 60s, something we call negative energy. And uh, what is negative energy? And it turns out that particles can have negative energy, provided they are moving backwards in time. So this dark matter could be something involving a final condition of the universe, which embeds it with a flood of something going backwards in time, some kind of luxonic form, which would appear to us as dark matter. Are you at this point now too, Fred, where you accept the possibilities of the multiverses that there's many out there? Well, you know, there are two, there are several kinds of multiverse theories that are playing around in our heads these days. There is multiverse theory, which comes about through something which is called string theory and super string theory and super symmetric string theory and something we call brains, B-R-A-N-E-S, uh, having to do with gravity uh, being a force between these brains, which are then multiple universes. That's what, that's, that's at the, that's at the very theoretical, almost un- unobservable, unexperimentally able to be proven edge of physics right now. And there's another parallel universe thing which comes into being, uh, actually in two different places. One is in general relativity when we're looking at things called black holes. Turns out that if black holes are rotating, they have an internal structure which leads into an infinite hall of mirrors, parallel universes. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's one thing that was discovered, oh, I'm not sure when that was. I think that's also in the 60s, so that's been playing around a while. Uh, I think it was a guy named Carr, K-E-R-R, from Australia, who first came up with that notion. Um, And the whole structure, the idea that black holes had structure was also discovered, uh, I think, in the late 50s, in which that idea first came came about, so people began to study black holes, and that's one place where parallel universes came out. But the major reason for parallel universes being popular today is probably quantum physics itself, because quantum physics makes this very strange prediction. It doesn't predict what actually happens. It only predicts with certainty what may happen. What may happen. <laughs> it's so crazy. <laughs> And when I say may, I mean all the possibilities, and each possibility is like a different universe. When you talk about these three discoveries, let's go through them again. The one okay. is the universe is not made of solid material, but is made of acts of consciousness. What does that mean? Right. What does that mean? Well, the way that comes about is pure quantum physics. You see, way back when, when people first began working with quantum physics, they started to raise the question, well, if quantum physics only allows us to predict possibilities, probabilities, but never actualities, events, but yet we live in a world of actualities and events, how does that come about? Where is the step that leads us from possibility into actuality? And people could not figure out any consistent way of making that happen in a mathematical way. Uh, In fact, it was Heisenberg himself who was the founder of the principle of uncertainty or indeterminism who realized that things appear as objective realities when we bring to bear our minds, our observational tools involving our minds upon the very things themselves. They're not things until they're observed. John Wheeler used to say, there is no universe out there, out there, until there's an in here, in here, observing it. Good point, yeah. So this means that observation or mind activity 
must be present in order for there to be anything at all. All right, hold on. for We're going to come back and talk about the rest of those discoveries, and we'll get into your thoughts about how God created the universe. Our guest tonight on Coast to Coast AM is Dr. Fred Allen Wolf. We're talking about his work, Time Loops and Space Twists. Fred, we were getting into these three areas of discoveries here, and you're talking about the mind field that uh, must be present in order for there to be a universe. Let's elaborate on that a little bit more. Okay. Uh, When the universe first began, when it first big banged, there was basically nothing. And then what was first created were all these luxons. Everything was moving at the speed of light. But something happened. And what happened, or how this happened, we don't really know. But suddenly there was this huge field that emerged and became part of the universe itself. We call it the Higgs field. Mm -hmm. I call it the mind of God. What it did is it began to affect some of those particles, namely all those guys that had what is called spin one half. I call them half spins. Maybe they were a little bit half nuts. They were half (laughs) spinners. And these half spinners got affected by this Higgs field, and they began, they actually slowed down. They went from moving at light speed to zigzagging into the Higgs field, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, effectively appearing on the average to be going slower than light. And there was something else called light itself, the kind of light that we see. That light just zipped through the Higgs field as if it wasn't there. So we had two kinds of light first emerging when the Big Bang occurred and this Higgs field came on. So the Higgs field is to be a God mind or mind of God. In fact, Leon Letterman, who won the Nobel Prize for his experimental discoveries at the uh, Fermi Lab, uh, actually wrote a book called calling this Higgs field or the particle that he hopes will be found from it, the God particle. Uh, he believed, I, I think he was thinking like I'm thinking, and maybe because he's, got, he's a little older right now, maybe he's not as afraid to use that terminology, but he actually called it that uh, because this is what it seems to be doing. Now, what does it do? In effect, what we're saying is this Higgs field is what is responsible for mass, and mass means inertia, and inertia means hardness. Inertia means the solid, substantial, substantial world of matter that we live in and push around and work with and go through life with. So this is basically the picture. Okay. Now, when you talk about God creating the universe, in your definition, what is God? Well, It's hard to say exactly what God is. What I'm looking at is what God does. (laughs) All right. That's that's the hard part. Uh, You you know, it it, it gets to a point where when we we push the mystery as far back into how much we can understand as possible. And the mystery starts right here with this field. So here we have this Higgs field, which to me is like God's brain, if you will. It's a huge, it's a brain as big as the universe. It's the huge thing itself. And yet it's, and yet it, it, it's, it's invisible. We don't, we don't really sense it. Although if you just think about little things you're doing, if you get out of your chair or lift your arm or whatever, what you're experiencing is you say, well, I'm experiencing the mass of my arm or the weight of my body or whatever. But actually what you're experiencing is your relationship of the light particles which are making you up interrelating with the Higgs field. So you're experiencing, if you will, and this is going to be mind-boggling for people listening out there, you're, walk, you're experiencing the mind of God. You are in the mind of God, so to speak. You are, if you will, dreams of the mind of God. You're light playing in God's mind. (laughs) Now, do you think... Now, that may be mind-boggling, but that's basically the picture we have here. I mean, it it does. You know, when when you said earlier that this Big Bang occurred from nothingness, I I can't comprehend what nothing is. Nobody can comprehend what it is. You see, there's, there's 
right now, nothing has become something. <laughs> I mean, I know what blank is, but blank is something. Well, yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. You see, we're at a point where our semantics gets us in the way. We get tongue-tied. We we end up in just our tongue twisting around in our heads and coming out with, blah, blah, I don't know. And, and we, we can't do anything with it. In fact, vacuum, so-called, that was supposed to be nothing. And we can now imagine a vacuum of nothing and a vacuum with the Higgs field. And we see there's a difference between the two. One is called real vacuum. The other is called false vacuum. We have all these kind of funny names that we give to nothing. <laughs> if we go into the spiritual aspect of it, this, this, this is another insight that you right. get. And this is important. What? And this is very important, the well, spiritual end important. of it. Get yeah. to the spiritual aspect. In the Bible, the very first few lines, it says that, you know, and God created the universe, and he said, let there be light, and there was light. Well, if you look at the way that's written in the Hebrew Bible with Hebrew letters— you have the word Aleph Vav Resh, which is pronounced or, which means light, in two places in the same grouping of letters. Now, Kabbalists, people who study the spiritual aspect of this stuff, they go a little bananas when they see light mentioned twice. They say, what is that? Why two lights? If God created light, once is enough. Why do you have to mention it twice? Because there are two kinds of light. There's the light that is going to be the stuff that becomes matter. That's the spin one half stuff. And there's light, which is going to be the medium of sending messages around, mm -hmm. which is the light we see with our eyes. So the God brain, if you will, is playing a game of dancing in light with light <laughs> that is bouncing around in the Higgs field, or you might call it the brain of God, brain mind of God, playing and doing this dance. And we are the outcomes of that dance. We're that dream. That's what we are. When this was written in the Torah, right? This well, is in the Torah. Or the, or the, the Bible. Right out of the Torah, yes. How did they know this? The writers? You know, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, some will say, wait a minute, it's the Word of God. And, you know, I can accept that. But, I mean, still, it's the, the, the actual writer. I know it or whether this is Fred Allen Wolf, Dr. Quantum, seeing this. When I look at it in Hebrew and I look at the Kabbalistic meaning of it and discuss it with other Kabbalists, we come to a similar conclusion, although they may not say it the same way. I learned this stuff from a, a guy whose name was Carlos Suarez. He was an Egyptian Jew. Um, who was born in Alexandria and learned to speak Hebrew with an Arabic accent. He said his pronunciation of Hebrew, which is closer to the Arabic pronunciation of the of right. Arabic characters, uh, he said is closer to the original Hebrew than even the Hebrew that's being spoken in Israel today. And he taught me all this Kabbalistic stuff. And when he taught, when he started explaining this to me, the, all this stuff to me, it started to make sense because I could suddenly see, wait a minute, this is quantum physics. But he didn't know anything about quantum physics. He wasn't a quantum physicist. He was an, he was formerly an architect, and yet he had this understanding. So I really believe that there is a spiritual quality to this mystery we have of this life. And we're beginning to unravel it right now. Uh, now, what's going to happen when it unravels? Who knows? But we're going to unravel it. And we're going to realize that we are the dreams of the mind of God. In other words, we're going to wake up to that reality, and that's going to change everything. I have gone, Fred, from, from the spiritual aspect in my earlier days to more of a scientific aspect, where now I'm going back to the spiritual aspect again. To, to me, and that's, that may sound confusing, but to me, the spiritual aspect of all this may be more important. It is more important at a certain level. But when, I mean, the reason I wrote this book is because I wanted to bring people that may be spiritually aware 
I wanted to give them some of the logos, the rational thinking, which will allow them to have a firmer grip even on their own spirituality. It won't defeat their spirituality. It will augment it in a tremendous way. For physicists who are just studying quantum field theory for the first time, you can even leave out the spirituality or the spiritual ideas that are in the book, and it's perfectly consistent with current thinking. So it's going to be helpful in a way you look at this thing. And, and I think it's very important that we emerge with a spiritual scientific basis in which such thing as, oh, that's impossible, starts to drift away from our thinking. And we begin to think that that anything which is really, you know, not impossible is compulsory. It's going to happen. So we have to begin to change our rationality here about what is really going on here and begin to realize that we can we can change things. It doesn't have to be the way it is. Tell me a little bit more about your thoughts about this mind field or the mind of God as you've written about in, in previous works as well, because it has a profound effect on how we look at things like death. Well, in terms of death, what I originally began to realize is that my personal awareness is largely subjugated or encapsulated or in processed, imprisoned by my bodily processes. In other words, I am aware for the most part because I have a body, and my body is my tool by which I become aware. So my mind is mind-body. But I also became aware that mind is not necessarily just body awareness. Obviously, it must be more than that because we're able to abstract and envision multiple dimensions, uh, ideas of God, spirituality, quantum physics. These are all things which are not bodily uh, oriented. In fact, we get in trouble making them bodily oriented because we try to make them into something that we can see and hear and touch with our senses, and quantum physics doesn't fit that picture. So obviously there's something about the quality of mind which escapes body. And when I began to look at this more carefully, even more rationally and logically, it became very clear to me that mind is not contained within body, but just the opposite. Body is contained within mind. So when I speak to you, in actual fact, it's just one of God's neurons bubbling away, mm -hmm. sending out light to another one of God's neurons, and there's no real separation between us. We have the illusion of separation. We have the illusion of being individualized. But as you see, as the world is being created, as we're beginning to internet, we're beginning to interweave, we're beginning to Facebook and tweet we are beginning to interrelate to realize that we are this one mind. This, what, this is what's going on. This is the reality. This is what we're living in. We're finding out that things are not so separated. And this is making the world wake up. And we're beginning to realize that we can't have a world in which we have half-starving and half-overly fed people. We're beginning to see that even selfishness itself, carried to an extreme, pays a price. That's right. And so so you know. we're waking up. Thank God, or thank ourselves, that we're finally awakening. And that's the job. That's 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 my job here. As long as I'm still kicking around in this body, <laughs> is to wake you up, get you aware, make you think, make you get spiritually awake. Be aware. Open up your heart. Open up your mind. Don't close down one for the other. you got to keep both going. Learn to think. Don't be afraid of mathematics. Mathematics ain't going to kill you. Mathematics is going to teach you how to think. Don't be afraid to learn new stuff. Fred, you just mentioned Internet, and I've always called this the wireless Internet, this connection that's between everything, not just us, but everything 
it's That's out it. there, and it and it had to have been done by design. There's no way this was an accident. No, I I, I totally agree. the The whole notion, I mean, that the people are talking themselves talking themselves into ruts, trying to get the design out of the equation. Even the book that Stephen Hawking and Leonard Mladeno wrote right, right. about the great design. They couldn't get out of it. <laughs> they, were, they were back to God whether they yeah. liked it or not. They just couldn't get out of it. I, I think they tried to, but they couldn't. No, you can't. You just can't. There's no way. So you can't rationalize no God. You just can't get out of it. You've got to bang, you've got to bring the mystery into it because you can't. It's not, it's not something which you can just say, well, it just creates itself. <laughs> that makes no sense. So you can't make that argument anymore. Nobody's going to buy that. And uh, uh, so even though they tried, uh, it, 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 it certainly isn't going to work. And it, is, it isn't working. We know there's a spiritual presence. And uh, I think that it's very much a part of the Higgs field. And even in the last chapter of the book, I try to explain a little bit about how some aspects of it work in terms of something I call the tachyonic field. But I won't go into that on the radio. But once you start reading the book and begin to realize that mind has this non-local ability to connect things that are faster than light, you can begin to understand how this mind field might come into the world. Fred, what about the, the physical life equation? What's the purpose of that? Of the life or light? Life. Life. Why the physical end? Why did we even need it? Okay, well, I'm going to give you a story. Now, this is my version of it. Okay. And uh, yeah, We may run up to the top of the hour, so we'll pick it up. I don't know how good this story is, but it's pretty close to what I think is going on. George, you're God, and you are all one. There ain't nobody else but you. And there you are. That's it. After a while, you're thinking... You know, it's okay to be all one, but you know, it's getting kind of boring. <laughs> Even God gets bored. Okay, wait a minute. Well, how am I going to get out of this fix? I'm everything there is, so how am I going to break out of this thing? Well, so you start thinking, I'll create some toys. I'll make some universes. I can make an infinite number of them because I'm God, so what? why, why not? Every time you make one, you make one mechanically. You try to make it like a Newtonian mechanical Wind up the clock and let it go, toy, a little toy marching across the table, and it breaks down and falls apart after a while. And uh, that's boring, boring, boring. <laughs> I can't get out of it. The only way you can get out of this is you've got to somehow make a toy that you can get yourself into and at the same time forget that you are the one that made the toy. So – you forget God. That's like the, you know, in the Garden of Eden. That's what happens when Adam, you know, um, Adam and Eve come out of that garden. They, in a way, forget who they really are. Mm-hmm. They're no longer God. Now they're they're people. They're life. They go through life and death. And why is death important? Because death is a return to the remembrance of who you are. But again, because we are basically addicted to the life-death process, even though it seems horrible at times and wonderful at other times, we're pretty addicted to it. We're pretty addicted to being in matter. We will keep coming back. And the Buddhists know about this, so they make what is known as the Bodhisattva vow. They say, hey, man, I ain't getting out of here until we're all out of here. Fred, we're at the top of the hour. I'm going to come back with you in just a moment on Coast to Coast AM. There's lots more to talk with you about as we talk about your work, time loops, and space twists. And, of course, our guest tonight, Dr. Fred Allen Wolf. We're talking about his work, time loops and space twists, and we'll be back with him in just a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back. Fred, do you think there are other people on other planets trying to question exactly what we're doing right now. They're they're thinking, how did this start? Who's God? What's going on here? Well, there are two possibilities here. Okay, first of all, there's a standard. I'll call it the standard possibility. Yes, Matilda, there are people on other planets because the chances of having just other planets without people seems to be overwhelmingly impossible, considering that. On our own planet, 
under really dire situations, we find life, even though life as we would normally wish it to be, would seem totally impossible. There's even evidence, for example, that there was life on Mars. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that in the state of evolution, of planetary evolution, that it seems inconceivable to me that life would only develop only on, on Earth. I, I, it just seems improbable to me. So I would say yes. Now here's another answer. This is the, this, this is like really far out, uh, and I admit this is total wacky kind of far out. So I'm going to make a wacky far out. All right. What's out there is us, that we're on all those other planets, and what we're looking at when we see the other planets are reflections of ourselves, some from the past, some from the future, some from other parallel universes, but they're all us. In other words, when we actually make contact, we're going to be shocked to find ourselves talking to ourselves. <laughs> and everything's a mirror. It may we're be. Not really, I mean, the universe is a kind of a light show. It may be. So, so a magician's trick. And, uh, and and I admit this is crazy. I mean, I. I uh, but it isn't so crazy. One physicist, Leonard Susskind, says that on the surfaces of black holes information gets collected and shown back out into the universe, and therefore, why us? We're no, nothing special on that information light show, so we must be, you know, just like a lens can produce multiple images, this, inf this information being produced can also be multiple, and we're just looking at ourselves in various phases of time and space. All right, so here is the $64,000 question. <laughs> Who made God? God made God because that's all there was. There is no God other than God. <laughs> I mean, you know. That's what my mother said a long time I, ago, I mean, right? Allah Akbar. I mean, it, 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 God is great because there is nothing else. Uh, I mean, they got that right. <laughs> There's nothing else. So uh, uh, there, there is no maker of God because there is nothing to be made. God is in a timeless, spaceless state. So to be made, to be unmade, to be created, to be annihilated, that's part and parcel of space-time matter. That's, part, that's in the show. That's part of the illusion. But before space-time and matter, there is something that is not space-time or matter. Therefore, the question of who makes what is unanswerable because there's nothing to reference it with. In order for me to say, where am I? I have to say, with respect to what? So if I ask, who made God, with respect to when? Yeah. My with mother when? once said, Fred, always was, always will be. Exactly. And, and, I wanted a better answer than that, though, from well, her. Well, I don't know. I don't think there is an, I don't think one can give an answer to that question, because when we frame questions using language, we frame them based upon language structure, which has within its own codification past, present, and future. I was, I will be, I am. Um, I have, I had, I will have. These are all based upon the structures of language, and they're all temporarily based. Time is a huge part of language. Without time, we couldn't even speak to each other and make any sense because we have a sense of time out of which we reference all of our languages and all of our words. But when you're talking about God, you're beyond space, time, and matter, so you can't use ordinary language. Interesting take. It really is. Oh, it's mind-boggling. <laughs> we need Twilight Zone stuff. So when p people who are really religious, not spiritual, but really religious, get involved with this, they go to the other extreme, where it's not science at all. It's all, you know, God did this, and, you know, he has created this. He can end it. He has done it. Uh, do you agree with that? No, because we're playing a part in it. And, uh, I mean, since everybody is God, uh, uh <laughs> we're all playing a part. We're, I mean, we're we're all doing what is what 
is going on in the God Light Show. So we're all part of it. No, I don't believe that, and I don't think that even makes any sense. In fact, I, 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 people write to me, and they, they have their own spiritual belief systems in which uh, 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 they're mainly dogmatic religious doctrine that they bought into, and uh, they really believe that what they bought into is the truth, and there's nothing going to shake them from that. They want to open up beyond that. In fact, that it was dogma that created Lutheran's religious uh, break with the Catholic Church, because he said, "Look, the, you guys are you, you guys are corrupt. The Catholic Church is corrupt right is corrupt right now. You're selling dispensation. You're telling people that you can get them out of out of." Uh, uh, that, that space which is between heaven and hell, that space uh, called the netherworld, or or whatever that's the, it's called in 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 the language of the Catholic religion. I don't remember what they call it anymore. But uh, uh, by paying money, uh, uh, you can get your ancestors or so forth to move out of a purgatory. That's it. They call it purgatory. So there's always been. I mean, religion when it grabs hold. Because it's dogmatic, it becomes a kind of a – has almost a dictatorial power. I'm not saying religion is bad. I'm saying that you got to think, you got to feel, you got to intuit, you got to sense, you got to have your heart open, but you don't necessarily have to believe that the guy standing in front of you has any better truth than you have yourself. Good point. In the past, people would uh... – categorize religion uh, in their own little ways. And now I think a lot of people are changing. Um, Case in point, there's a group out there that thinks it's going to come to an end on May 21st. Judgment Day, it's all over, it's done. The chosen ones will be taken, and off we go. I interviewed them, Fred. I tried to get them to come down and say they're going to be on the show. That The 21st of May, by the way, is a Saturday, so I wanted them to be on the show Monday the 23rd. They refused because they said they weren't going to be around. These people, they wouldn't budge. They they will not budge. So when that date comes, and they've been wrong on two other dates in the past, I suspect that they'll come up with another date. Oh, yeah, they'll rationalize it. No, I, yeah, there, there are those guys that Doe and T or those crazy nuts that killed themselves and uh, ascended to, you know, according to, ascended to one of the, I don't know, what are they, a comet or something like that? I mean, they, they, uh, hail bomb. Yeah. What the hail bop comet? Yeah, hail bop comet. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that's that was really wacky. But I mean, to me, that that's that's carrying it too far. I mean, that's just that's uh, that's allowing zeal to overcome rational thought, and God has not intended you to be zealous over your rational mind. He's not intended your rational mind to to dissipate your spiritual belief systems, but he's certainly not intended the other way around. So you you can't give up thinking. You can't give up educating. You can't give up learning about the true magic and beauty of this universe. And by simply accepting what somebody tells you is being true, rather than experiencing for yourself and opening your mind for a better experience of what's going on, you simply – it's like – blinding yourself. It's putting daggers in your eyes and cotton in your ears and putting a, a senseless uh, stuff around your skin so that you can't feel, you can't hear, you can't see. You become deaf, dumb, and blind. You become the, the opera Tommy. <laughs> what, what, what is the purpose of living, in, in your opinion? Why are we here? Now, the purpose of living is, is in my mind, it's because God wants to have this experience. Uh, this is God's desire. Uh, we are part of this desire. Uh, we all sense the desire to have life. And that, I think, is very much a part of the way, uh, you might say, we want it. Is, is it a learning? We don't, want to be, we don't want to be all one. Is it a learning curve? Be, is that why we're here? What's that? Are we here because it's a learning curve? No, no, we already know it. It's it's what I would call a forgetting. It's it, it's the great forgetfulness, and then the relearning to get back to where we came from. But we're going to keep going through these cycles for as long as we desire 
them. As soon as we stop desiring these kinds of cycles, these kinds of dreams, the dream will change. But it's really us. We're doing it. And it's very hard. I mean, it's very hard for people to understand that they're creating their own reality. But that's what everybody's doing. We're part of the dream. And, you know, like when you're in a dream, if you ever had a lucid dream, you may notice that you can create your reality in a lucid dream. That's right. The same thing is going on in a waking life. It's just a more complex type of dream uh, involving the whole God mind rather than your individual mind like you would have in your individual dream, lucid dream life. But it's the same basic thing. So what, what we're doing is basically forgetting who we really are and then remembering who we really are to have the experience of remembering who we are because it's delightful to remember who we really are once having forgotten it. Why not let us live physically forever? Why do we even have to die? Uh, The problem is that it's a quantum mechanical world. (laughs) (laughs) And quantum mechanics is not a game of certain days. It's a game of Probabilities. Probabilities. And because it's probabilities, because that maximizes the possibilities for learning and grasping and moving forward, life has to come as individual experiences in single bodies has to end. Because if you look at the DNA structures, if you look at the structures of our cellular tissue, Errors are continuing to, pop, continuing to propagate in time to make new possibilities take place. At the same time, there's a steady deterioration. And that's all part of the process. So living forever, although that may sound wonderful, would become tedious and boring. And remember what God's original dream is. I don't want to be bored anymore. I don't want to be bored. <laughs> I want to have the adventure. I, I, I want this. I'm addicted to this kind of thing. I want to. I want to feel. I want to have this feeling. I want to. I want to dance. I want to feel. I want to make love. I want. I want to have these experiences. And he can only do that through us. That's what he can only do that through us. Only through. Uh, only by being human. Only yeah. by or, or animal. I mean, by being alive. Yeah. Being alive. What about the angelic realm? Does it, does it exist? It exists as images of possibilities so that we can aspire to make up stories thereof. They're kind of part of the imaginal realm. And whether the imaginal realm is an ex- existing thing like the material realm is, that gets into a whole other subject. And I really haven't gotten into that other than through dreams. So you might say the angelic realm might be a realm of dreams, but I don't really even think that's what it is. I think my when, I do, when I've had these lucid dream states that I go into other worlds, they're worlds that look pretty much like this world that we're in now, but they're not the same worlds. I've had lucid dream states where people were skiing down mountains, but they weren't skiing on skis. They were like flying down the mountains as if they were skiing on air streams. Yeah, yeah. And I've had this kind of a dream. And, of course, I've had dreams of flying and doing things that, you know, people say, well, it's just, you know, an illusion. It's a hallucination. It's a – people dismiss these kinds. I don't think so. They're lucid. When I mean lucid, I mean I'm having my senses awakened and I'm in control of what's going on. I've had other kinds of dreams, too, with their stories being told. They're, they're, they're remarkable. They're really stories. Things happening, people talking to me, or things going on, events, and I wake up from them and I can remember them. Uh, not all the time. Not, not all my dreams are worth talking about, but when they are, they become very eventful. I don't think these are angelic realms. I think these are realms of other existences, or even realms of myself in my parallel realities. So I'm beginning to think, though, that biblically speaking, that maybe that's the way it is, too. Maybe those words in the Bible truly are accurate, Fred, and, you know, maybe subject to interpretation, but that 
a little bit of that and a little bit of quantum uh, physics, maybe there's a mixture there. I think there is. I think there is. And uh, as I said, I, I, I've been written about this in several of my books, Mind into Matter, Matter into Feeling, right. the Spiritual Universe, and now the Time Loops book. There's a there's a bit of that in there. There's probably more of the physics uh, kind of stuff in the Time Loops book, but there's more of the uh, Kabbalistic thinking and the meaning of the Hebrew letters and stuff like that in the other books, like Mind into Matter. So if people want to get more into that, there's other stuff that they can get into. I also have audio courses that you can listen to uh, from Sounds True that uh, you, you might find of interest, too. When you talk about time loops, what does that mean? Well, that's the most interesting part, in a way. Uh, it's a hint that time isn't only a one-way street. The reason that they became interesting is because a time loop is composed of a particle, which now has been emerged by banging into the Higgs field, so it's now more or less got mass, Mm -hmm. like an electron, for example, and it's banging around, it's moving, and it reaches a certain place where it interacts with an energy field of some kind, any any energy field at all, usually something more powerful, like maybe a nuclear energy field or something else even, and it turns around in time and goes backward in time until it reaches the place where it started where it first got created, and then it follows and goes into a loop. And if you look at both sides of that loop, first of all, the loop which is going from where it, got, where it started to where it ends, that's like an electron. Where it goes backward in time, it's still an electron, but since it's going backward in time to make the loop, it doesn't look like that to us because we move forward in time. So something going backward in time, let's say it goes from – time 6 o'clock to time 5 o'clock. Well, we don't go from time 6 o'clock to time 5 o'clock. We go from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock. So what it'll look like to us is something going forward in time in the opposite direction. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm with you. I'm so with you. that we call a positron or antimatter. So the whole thing that's to remind us and why the time loops are necessary is they – are there to remind us that the Higgs field itself acts creatively and destructively. It can create and annihilate. And by creating, it creates a positron and electron. That's the beginning of the loop. By annihilating, it annihilates the electron and positron. That's the end of the loop. But we see it as a total loop. Now, these loops exist throughout the whole universe. In fact, everything that travels eventually makes these kinds of loops. There are quark loops. There are electron loops. There are, for every particle you can think of, there are these virtual loops which come into being. And what they do is they set a stage. They provide a background, a dynamic background, in which annihilation and creation processes, as we experience them through one-way street a long time, provide us with a sense of life and death. Brad, we're going to come back with you in a moment. Let's talk about time travel. And also, I still got to ask you about that Big Bang when we come right back. With our special guest tonight, Dr. Fred Allen Wolf, we're talking about his latest work, Time Loops and Space Twists. We'll be back with more on Coast to Coast AM. Fred, will physical time travel be possible if we can harness some of these things that we've been uh, talking about? It's certainly theoretically possible. It's not outside of the realm of our current understanding of the theory that involves space, time, and matter. It's within that. Specifically, uh, there are two different kinds of time travel that we can talk about. One is the normal kind, like you see in the movies. Uh, Goes back Back to the Future and uh, meets his mom and pop before they had him, so to speak. That kind of you know silliness in the movies, which is a lot of fun. Uh, that's uh, physical time travel. In order to do that, you would have to be able to create a kind of time machine. And that time machine would consist of really a wormhole, which is a black hole with two ends, so to speak, <laughs> 
yeah. which has been separated and pulled apart. By the way, if you want to read more about this, you can read a book by Kip Thorne, Kip Thorne from Caltech, who wrote a book about uh, this kind of wormhole. You can also read my book, uh, Yoga of Time Travel, which explains in, in, in detail with pictures just how you would do this kind of time, time machine. And you could then separate the two ends, the two uh, parts of the wormhole, and put them one in the future and one, in the, and one would actually be in the past. And you could uh, loop. You could go from one to the other. Um, and uh, even though as time went on and both ends of the, uh, of the wormhole would be moving through time, you could still go back to a relative past or relative future, but you would have to build one of those things. And the problem is these loops don't – I'm sorry, these uh, 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 wormholes are unstable. They tend to squeeze together because there are nothing on the inside, and vacuums suck. <laughs> yeah. So they would suck it closed. So uh, they have negative pressure. So you would have to put, you have to put in some kind of a um, sub, something that would hold it open. And uh, I think Kip Thorne came came up with the idea of something called exotic matter, which we don't know what that even is. But it would be something which would have uh, positive pressure and would keep the whole uh, from collapsing in on itself. It's possible that uh, dark energy in the universe may have this property. You know, there's both kinds of, two kinds of dark stuff in the universe. There's dark matter and there's dark energy. And the dark matter is what keeps the galaxies from flying apart because there's not enough matter to keep them moving like they're moving. Uh, and there's dark energy, which keeps the universe uh, moving apart, accelerating as it goes. So uh, dark energy would be a kind of repulsive kind of an effect, and dark matter would be kind of a negative, attractive kind of effect. So we'd have to have some way to capture dark energy to keep these wormholes open. It's not impossible if we could ever figure out just exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about dark matter and dark energy. We might be able to build one of these things. All right. And when you have talked about the Big Bang, earlier again we talked about nothingness, which is difficult for me to comprehend. But if there was a Big Bang in nothingness, how the heck did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. We're, we're playing with that. Uh, Roger Penrose has the notion that uh, there wasn't just one Big Bang. There's been bangs going on ad infinitum from the beginning of something, which is not time. So there's been a lot of bangs, bang, crunch, bang, crunch, bang, crunch, or uh, that the ending of the universe is just the start of another one. There's the whole idea that the universe expands and then crunches. Uh, there's that kind of picture. Right now it doesn't seem to be the case because the universe seems to be accelerating. In its, in its expansion. But we, so we're not really quite sure what's going on there. Uh, but anyway, uh, what caused that to happen is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Ask anybody. We don't know. How did it start? I haven't got any idea. I mean, we can say, you know, God did it, but, you know, that doesn't really answer it from a physicist's point of view. Uh, something about the nature of vacuum here here's what we do know nothing is unstable that is empty space itself has a tendency to bubble and produce matter and antimatter time loops space time vacuum itself makes time loops they just bubble in bubble out bubble in bubble out bubble in bubble that's called we can feel the effect of that it's called vacuum polarization we can see it happening but it's part of the vacuum itself. The vacuum itself is not just sitting there with its not doing anything. It's bubbling, 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 bubbling bubble, bubble, toil and trouble like Macbeth's witches. It's constantly bubbling and uh, making matter and antimatter time loops uh, throughout everywhere. With so uh, this seems to be maybe that's what the universe did when it first started. There might have been a giant bubble. And then the question is, what happened to the antimatter? <laughs> exactly. Where'd it go? And with that an understanding... question hasn't quite... There's a, what's called a break in the symmetry here. And uh, that broken symmetry uh, may have trapped matter and uh, uh, so that there was slightly more matter than antimatter. That was, there was more electrons going forward in time than going backward in time. And, and why that happened, we don't know. 
with an understanding in all of this, what does that do to somebody's life? How can they use this to make their own existence a little better? Well, the first and the most important thing is to realize that all this creation and acti- and, 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 and annihilation, all these activities are going on inside of you, which means that you can't help but have new ideas, new feelings, new experiences. You can't help it. It's going to happen. So life is continually going to be exciting for you once you begin to recognize that that's where your life really abounds. It's there. It's right there. It's going on inside of you. The Big Bang is going on right inside of you right now. So once you begin to recognize that and sense it, you will sense it, you begin to realize that anything that you say that stabilizes you saying, I am that, or I am this, or I can't do that, or I won't do this, are simply statements of you asserting control over this process. But they're not statements of fact. They're not statements which actually tell you who and what you are. You really cannot say who and what you are because it's continually changing by all these processes. So what it does is it gives you a kind of a bubbling self-confidence. It bubbles into your makeup of your life and you realize, you know, I can be anything I want to be. There's nothing holding me back. Uh, why did I think I wasn't capable of mm-hmm. doing that? And the answer is only your thought was capable of keeping you from holding your back. And once your thought becomes part of your regime of life, it forms a kind of a, oh, I would call it a rut, like a, you know, like an alley when you go bowling, those little uh, side ruts on the sides of a, where you throw the, the bowling ball down. I, what are those things called? The gutter. The old the, the gutter. gutter. Yeah, I hit that many times. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're doing when you're creating thoughts, I can't do this, I won't do that, I'm not going to do that, you're creating gutters in your consciousness. And what happens is that that's your creation. So the mind reinforces your creation over and over again. I know people who have created a situation in which something they tasted as a child, they've never forgotten. And so they'll never eat that again. <laughs> because it tasted terrible when they were a baby. Well, so they're or not it's, touch that stuff ever again. It's like working in a pizza shop. You you, you right. get tired of it, so you won't. You won't eat pizza if you work there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the, yeah. You just get over and over. You create these the, these these gutters in your consciousness, and you your ball every time you throw your ball, it's just right right in the gutter. You can't throw a strike because you're not trying something new. You're not. You're simply throwing gutter balls. Good point. Let's take a few calls here, Fred, before next hour. Derek in Long Island, New York. You're on with Dr. Fred Allen Wolf. Yeah, good Good morning, uh, Fred, and good morning, uh, George. Hi, Derek. George, it's a great, it's a great guest. It's one, this is the best, one of the best shows I've heard. Uh, Fred, where are you located? San Francisco. Open oh, okay, your that's, 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 that's too far for us to get together for lunch. But at any rate, I <laughs> wanted to ask you a couple of questions. The first was, about ego, and the second was, have you read any of, I've never heard anybody speak on George's program that has been so close to what I understand the truth to be, and have you ever read anything approaching this thing from a philosophical viewpoint instead of a scientific viewpoint? In other uh, words, well, whose philosophy are you referring to? There's a lot of philosophical have you, have you, viewpoints have you, have out Have you there. ever read any of the books by Belzacar, Consciousness Speaks, or any of those? What's the guy's name again? Uh, his name is Ramesh Belzakar. No, I haven't read him. You've got to uh, pick up that No, book. I haven't. I'm sorry to say I do not know this person. Just remember that. Consciousness speaks. He was an understudy of Nisargadatta. Okay. But he puts well, you can the... always drop me a line by uh, – uh, my... I have a Facebook page, a Twitter page, and I have email – uh, Fred at FredAllenWolf.com. So you can always drop me a line by email. And Fred, I'm, Fred I'm a dinosaur. I don't, I don't use <laughs> cell phones, computers, or <laughs> oh, or you're, you, you're, you're a rarity, rarity though, dear. Kind of guys. Okay, okay, I gotcha. You're a rarity. You're using the new social networking now, Fred, too. It's an, it's incredible, isn't it? 
Uh, it's interesting. I, I don't know if it's incredible yet, but it's certainly interesting. I, 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 I'm uh, making contacts with people that I uh, didn't think I could. It gets, so it I'm gets very happy that out. it's going on, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to, to getting involved more. That I first, I just want to didn't want to. I, I feel more like you, Derek. I don't, I, I don't want to do that stuff. I just want to, you know, eh, do my own thing. Get in my own gutters. I don't want to throw strikes anymore. I want to throw gutter balls. And I finally gave up on throwing gutter balls and said, I'm going to get to Facebook and Twitter. And Derek, get a computer. <laughs> Fred, where do you see the next major breakthrough in science or in what we're talking about, some metaphysical? I'll tell you what it is. Everything I'm telling you right now about the mind of God is speculation. I can't tell you it's scientifically proven yet. But I want to tell you that I've been about 20 years ahead in these ideas. Mm -hmm. About 1975, a couple of us, Jack Friday, Bob Tobin, and I wrote a book called Space, Time, and Beyond in which we talked about time travel and uh, quantum entanglement and uh, uh, gravity field. We, We talked about all the stuff that at that time was considered to be wacko, craziness. And now that the 90s and now we're into the next millennium, all that's now being published in the rigid journals of physical theory. All the wackiness is now standard stuff. So taking that as a hint, I'm suggesting that the next frontier of physical inquiry will be the nature of mind and understanding this thing about the Higgs field as being literally the mind of God. And that's going to be where we're going. That's what we're headed for, and that's going to take some more discoveries, some more ideas, some more understanding of things about things going faster than light, what I call tachyons. Uh, That's going to be part of the language of this new way of thinking, and we're going to be able to understand that a little bit better. Right now, it's still there. It's mathematical. There is a theory, but it's speculative. Well, there was a point, and still most scientists do, they think that when you deal with the brain, you're dealing with the mind, and I'm not sure that's the case anymore. I think that... Well, it's... it's, uh, the. What I used to do was say, well, brain is a noun, mind is a verb. Yep. Mind and time are very intimately related. Brain and space are very intimately related. Brains exist in space, mind exists in time. Good point. Next up, Abilene, Texas, Joe, east of the Rockies. Hey, Joe, go ahead. Oh, this could be real fun. Uh, Thank you. And Fred, uh, the name of the Creator, uh, there's a big hint there. We keep getting tied up with God and the translation of I am as an intransitive. The word Yahweh is a future causative hip hill form of the verb, meaning I have created, I am creating, I will create. It's a continuum of explosive creation. Hence, it's accelerating outward, and isn't that the concept of creation we have now? And the clue is in the name itself. Okay. Uh, the, uh, in 8-7 of Romans, Paul is giving us a hint, and he says, the carnal mind, that Darwinian thing between our ears, is not subject to the Torah, nor indeed can it be. It won't program what we're trying to find. We're struggling down here in the engine room, trying to get up to the uh, command post here and look out through the windscreen to find out where we're going. And so rather than using the knowledge and wisdom, which is available to everyone from all kinds of education, asking for, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, understanding, which is his mind, which is a gift, and is thereby laying aside by meditation or uh, some of the concepts you've been talking about, laying these aside and asking for understanding, which is asking to see things through his eyes. It's a gift. And so this uh, mind 
uh, this universal mind, this uh, thing of this, the Yahweh spirit, is a gift given, and I've experienced it a couple of times, and it's amazing how you can get beyond education and get away from the intellect of the carnal mind into the intelligence of the human spirit. I'd like to get your comments on it. Well, I would say these are your ways of dealing with your experiences, and they're perfectly rational to me what you're doing. Uh, I wouldn't see them the same way you do, but I understand where you're coming from. So uh, you, uh, for me, the scientific or rational is very much integrated into my way of thinking. Rather than saying I don't want the intellect to get in the way of my experience of Yahweh. By the way, in Kabbalah, Yahweh is yod Hey vav Hey. yod is the Hebrew, 10th Hebrew letter, letter, and it stands for that which has come into existence. He is the 5th Hebrew letter, and it stands for breath of life. So existence breathes life. Then we have Vav, and Vav is the 6th Hebrew letter, and that stands for fertilization, propagation, communication. And then we have another hay, another breath of life. So what we have is existence, breathing life, fertilizing more life. So a Yahweh is the principle of existence, giving life to fertilize more life. On the other hand, Elohim, or Allah, or Elo, uh, is Aleph Lamed the Aleph Lamed uh, He uh, is is Allah, and that is a different. That's a different principle altogether. That is much more deeper in its exact its existence at the more primal level, dealing with Aleph. A lot of the sacred letters, sacred words from Kabbalah, all begin with Allah. For example, the Hebrew for man is Ish, and for woman it's Esha. And Ish is Aleph Sheen, which means the spirit Aleph. Sheen is the cosmic movement. So the spirit cosmically moving is what we call man. Fred, when we come back, we're going to take uh, full phone calls next hour with you right here on Coast to Coast AM. Plus, I want to ask you if the universe will ever end. Well, on our next Coast to Coast program, we're going to talk about social networking and what some of the big boys are trying to do. When we come back, we'll take phone calls for the entire hour with Dr. Fred Allen on Coast to Coast AM. And we're with Dr. Fred Allen Wolf. Fred, will the universe, the way we know it, end? Will it disappear? Will it crunch itself together? I think it's going to do that. Um, If it's following the... The, the pattern that I see as part of the creation annihilation dance of Shiva, so to speak, uh, it's going to end. But that doesn't mean it ain't going to start up again. See, maybe that's what the Big Bang is. Maybe it expands and then it contracts. And, and it then expands it, again. And yeah, then it explodes I, I, up. That kind of story is what is going on. Although It doesn't look like that's happening now. It looks like it's accelerating in its expansion, and this is primarily due to this dark energy field, which seems to be pushing things more apart. And there's a kind of a battle going on between dark energy pushing things apart and dark matter squeezing things back together again. So it's hard to say for sure what's going on because we don't quite understand dark energy and dark matter. Those are what physicists now call the the 9,000-pound elephants in the room that we are ignoring. <laughs> and I have a little bit to say about it, but not not enough yet to really tell people I know what's going on there. I don't really do. All right, let's go back to the phones. Cynthia.